welcome. My name is Andrew Ridland, and I'm a dual degree student here at St. Thomas, earning my master's in Catholic studies, Dr. Naughton over there, as well as my law degree with uh, many professors who are in the room right now. Uh, on behalf of the Murphy Institute, allow me to express our gratitude for your presence here today. It's such an honor to have you. Today's presentation is going to be focused on the keys of practicing law as a practicing Catholic. The structure of today's presentation will consist of roughly 35 to 40 minutes of hearing from Professor Granardo, followed by a time of Q&A, and just a couple of practical notes. Today's uh, presentation is approved for one CLE credit, and so if you haven't signed in yet, please do so after the presentation. And then this will also be recorded. So if there's something that strikes you and you want to go back to it or you feel inspired to share this talk with others, please feel free to do so. And I believe that will be posted on the Murphy website after the talk. As I mentioned, today's CLE is going to be offered by Professor David Granardo. Professor Granardo just recently joined the St. Thomas community, coming to us from St. Mary's University School of Law down in Texas, all the way up to Chile, Minnesota. Uh, now he serves not only as a, you know, a professor here on staff, but he's also a co-director of the Halloran Center for Ethical Leadership in the Professions. Prior to teaching, Professor Granardo worked at various law firms, including Jones Day, DLA Piper, and King and Spalding, where he represented clients in complex commercial litigation, uh, but that's not all he did. During that time, he also dedicated a significant portion of his practice to pro bono work, representing the rights of uh, victims of domestic violence, as well as developmentally disabled individuals and uh, First Amendment litigants. In fact, he was so successful in this pro bono work, or so I'm told, that he was awarded um, special awards from the bar in Texas, as well as California. And finally, <clears throat> although I've only just begun to get to know Professor Granardo on a personal level, he is a man of deep faith who has chosen to invest a significant amount of his free time in the spiritual well being of this school, whether that's through his regular attendance at Mass or his service on the Spiritual Life Committee. And so I'm very confident in saying that today's presentation will offer us several helpful insights into being a practicing Catholic while practicing law. And those insights are going to be informed by a man of deep faith who lives what he teaches in his daily life. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Gernardo. Thank you, Andrew, for that introduction. Just a little bit more background on me. So I grew up in Colorado. My, my mom was born and raised in Poland. My dad was born and raised in Guyana in South America, and I'm a cradle Catholic. So they were both Catholic. I'm Catholic. I grew up, of course, I played football at Rice. I grew up, of course, wanting to play football at Notre Dame as a Catholic kid. And playing football at Rice after wanting to play at Notre Dame is like wanting to go to Ruth's Chris Steakhouse and ending up at Burger King. But um, anyway, all right, this is an easy crowd, I can tell. I appreciate that. So there are, when, when, when I was asked to speak, I thought about the three, but three things stuck out to me, the key things to practicing laws of practicing Catholic. And I was told before the talk, I need to stay within this area. Okay. So I typically I'll be walking around, but I need to stay within this area. So the mic picks me up. Well, one of the three keys to me, I believe as a Catholic in practicing law is human dignity human dignity, and it has its roots in Genesis. And so God created man in his own image, and the image of God created them. Male and female created he them. So this is, for me, this forms part of the basis of not only being a Catholic, but also being a practicing lawyer. Because of my identity, so my mom's white, my dad is uh, black, and, he, and also my grandpa was Indian. So my mom very much early on knew I need to help this person with his identity because there's a lot of things going on with this guy. So if you're wondering where I got the big weird eyebrows, now you know, it's the diversity. So uh, she said, David, you are first a human. You're like everybody else. And my in-law, my father-in-law, he says the same thing. He said the same thing, same, same thing to my wife growing up. 
You're no better than anybody and nobody's better than you. That's where we start off. We're all human. We all have the right to be treated with dignity and respect because we are all created in God's image. And then my mom said, and you are Catholic. The second thing you are is Catholic. That means we have certain beliefs and morals and values. Then you're all those other things. Yes, you're black, you're Polish, you're South American, you're all those things, you're Indian. But this is where it starts with the human dignity. And I understand, we all understand that a lot of other religions have human dignity as one of the core parts of their teachings. Islam, Buddhism, Judaism, obviously this is part of Judaism as well. But as Catholics, this should guide us in everything that we do. So I had one law student who was interviewing for a job at a firm, a very small firm, and went, to the, went into the office and the, the secretary said, it'll just be about 15 minutes until the partner comes out. There was one managing partner there and maybe two or three attorneys in the office. And the law student was very patient there, struck up a conversation a little bit with the secretary, was very respectful. Secretary, 15 minutes later, walks out, comes back and says, hi, it's time for your interview. I'm the managing partner. She wanted to see how this law student would treat this individual. Because she said, I want to know how you're going to treat the staff, the custodians, opposing counsel, court staff, anybody you come in contact with, hopefully you're treating them with that dignity and respect. So I'm not telling you this so that now you're wondering if you have some undercover boss somewhere and you're just going to be nice to them for that reason. Hopefully, it's not just opposing counsel and everybody that we come into contact with that we're treating like this. Hopefully, we're treating everyone, the person who's serving us food at McDonald's to the managing partner of the office, we're treating them each with that dignity and respect. And one of the things that I try to tell students in that St. Thomas Law does a tremendous job of doing is teaching law students that your faith, your morals, your beliefs shouldn't be disconnected from the practice of law. It should actually be something that guides you as a lawyer. So in order to get some CLE credit, we look at the Minnesota Rules of Professional Conduct. The preamble to the rules, again, the preamble, that's not enforceable, but it's a framework and it guides the application of the Rules of Professional Conduct. It says difficult issues of professional discretion must be resolved through the exercise of sensitive professional and moral judgment. So not only are we saying at St. Thomas Law, yes, your morals should be a part of, the, of your practice of law, the rules, the Minnesota Professional Rules of Conduct, and this is based off of the ABA model rules of professional conduct, which has this exact same language that has been adopted by the states. The preamble, sometimes identically in, in, the, in the states, sometimes with a little variation. Preamble paragraph 16, the rules do not however exhaust the moral and ethical considerations that should inform a lawyer. So our morals, our beliefs, they should be a part of how we practice law. Not only that, this is the actual rule 2.1 when you're advising a client, we shall exercise independent professional judgment and render candid advice. That candid advice may include moral considerations. So it is a part not only of the way that we need to view issues that come up with in the law, but also the way that we advise clients. And sometimes, and, and, and President Vischer in an article talked about this and some of the students here who read for more reasoning, or at least pretend that you read that part for more reasoning, know that it's important for a lawyer to recognize how their own morals and their own moral judgments are included in the advice that they're giving. And to be explicit and intentional when talking to a client, you know, I think this is what we should do and here's why. And to recognize that because your morals may not be aligned completely with the clients, but recognizing that and being explicit and intentional, that's going to help the client come to, okay, I have all the information I need. I'm taking your input here and here's what I'm going to do. So this should be a part of the way that we practice law. All right. So another, the second key to me, and I've written a lot about this. And I practiced for almost a decade in corporate civil litigation, but did a lot of pro bono work. This was something that came up all the time. If you practice, civility is an issue that you've dealt with. And where's the basis of that? Again, this is the second key to practicing law as a practicing Catholic. It's the golden rule. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. So this is actually in the legal literature, 
uh, articles that talk about civility. This is the golden rule is said to be the genesis, pun intended, of the of this of this doctrine. Now, in the legal doctrine, in the uh, legal literature, this is the definition for civility, generally defined as treating others with courtesy, dignity, and respect, as well as demonstrating cooperation, honesty, and restraint. There are three major reasons why civility is important. We heard we, this was a quote from uh, former Justice Sandra Day O'Connor: "The pleasure lawyers find in practice, it will enhance the pleasure lawyers find in practice." So. If you have practiced long enough, uh, unfortunately, you've probably run into somebody when they call you and their name comes up on the phone, your blood just starts to boil. You see their name and you're like, oh gosh, here we go with opposing counsel. I had one person in particular that always sticks out. And every time, I, this is a pro bono case for family law. Every time I saw this lawyer, every single time at a hearing or when I called him on the phone, he would say the exact same thing every time. David, I'm going to get you sanctioned. I'm going to get you sanctioned by the State Bar of California. I'm going to get you sanctioned by the court. And, and I was never doing anything wrong. But every time, that's how our conversation started off. And then finally, I said, do you say this to everybody? And he says, yeah, and I actually like you, David. That was his tactic. That's what he believed that incivility was a tool. But when you're when you're working al alongside or against somebody like that, it creates unnecessary stress. And you're not focusing on the merits of the case. You're focusing on dealing with someone who's just trying to intimidate, harass, just be obstreperous for no particular reason. So yes, when we have civility, when you have someone on the other side of, your, of the transaction or of the case, it makes the practice of law more pleasurable. Okay, also increase the effectiveness of our justice system. We'll talk about that in a second. We're not wasting time in the courts or our clients' money in court arguing about things that we shouldn't and certainly improving the public's perception of lawyers. So this comes up and I talked to the state court judges in Pennsylvania about civility. And this was last spring. And they said one of the number one reasons they see incivility in their courtroom is because of pro se individuals, people who are representing themselves. And these pro se individuals, they believe that they have to be rude and obnoxious because that's what they see on TV. That's what they see in the movies. That's what they see in the news. So part of what we do when we act uncivil, we demean our profession and we, we decrease the amount of trust and faith that the public has in this system. It's not about just being the loudest and most obnoxious person. That's the person that wins. That's not typically how it goes. So here are the costs. First, you can lose a case. Now, some people will say sometimes if a case is so close, they'll they'll go with the lawyer that they like more. Well, in real in, in more realistically, what happens is if you have attorneys who are acting so uncivil, they can be disqualified from a case. Okay, there's a there was a a lawyer, this is just one example. I'm not going to tell you what state it's from. I'm not here to embarrass any states, but in Florida, and you can believe it or not. And he said, we're only going to have these depositions. I'm only going to let you take depositions of my witnesses at the loudest Dunkin' Donuts in town. Okay. So he said, so then he was defending these depositions. This attorney said, I'll only defend it at the loudest Dun uh, Dunkin' Donuts. And then during all these depositions, he showed up in shorts. He was playing Angry Birds and drawing male genitalia during all of it. Okay. And first of all, he couldn't even hear the witnesses because they were in the loudest Dunkin' Donuts. So all of these things. And the court said, why were you doing that? And he said, zealous advocacy. That's always the that's always the defense. That's always the argument. I was being a zealous advocate. Well, what happened is they got disqualified from the case because of that incivility. So now they're costing the firm money and they're losing a client as well. All right, increasing costs for clients and wasting judicial resources. So we've all been, if you practice long enough, you've been asked for an extension. Can I have more time on this discovery? Can I have more time? Can we continue this hearing? Can we continue this trial? And what happens is if, so what I would do, I'd always ask the client, I'd say, look, can we give this extra time? And they would always say yes. Now, being civil is doing things and treating others 
in a certain way with dignity and respect, but never to prejudice the client. So this isn't about, I'm going to do things that, that they're going to harm my client. So if it's not going to prejudice my client, I will give you that extension. I will give you that extra time. What happens when you don't? All right. Uh, the opposing counsel says, I want to do a motion. I want to file a motion to continue this trial or continue this summary judgment hearing. If it's not going to prejudice my client, and it's because they have someone in their family who's passed away or who's very sick, and I say no, now I'm going to have to oppose it. Now I'm going to have to file that opposition. That's costing the client money. Then I have to go argue this to the judge, and I'm probably going to lose a lot of points, especially if it's a bench trial and they're the trier of fact. I'm going to lose points with the judge, either consciously or subconsciously, that I am now opposing this. Even if it's a jury trial, the judge is still issuing rulings on, on issues of law. So it is not a good, and I'm wasting the client's money, and I'm wasting the court's time. So it makes no sense to do this. I had one, one friend in San Antonio, he told me the story that opposing counsel said, can we please continue this trial because my wife's sick and it wouldn't prejudice my friend's client. So he said, yeah, we'll, we'll continue this trial one month. The next month, opposing counsel, my wife's sick. Can we continue the trial? My friend says, yes, that's fine. The next month, the opposing counsel says it again. And this, this time, my friend said, he's like, and usually when you tell a story about your friend, it's really about you, but this really was about someone else. And he said, no, I, I think this guy's just pulling my chain and we're just going to go ahead with trial the third time. Trial starts at nine and lawyer comes in there, opposing counsel, your honor, can we postpone till the afternoon? Cause I need to go to my wife's funeral. So one of the reasons that we want to extend that courtesy to others, we don't know when we're going to need that courtesy as well. Let's talk about discovery. If someone says, hey, our witness isn't here to answer these interrogatories, uh, can we have an additional time? Or else I'm going to send you over some, some responses that aren't complete or the same with documents. Somebody at the, they're, they're on vacation, they can't get to it. We're going to send you an incomplete set unless you give us some more time. We'll say, no, give it to us now. Okay, then now I have to write a meet and confer letter about how these are deficient responses. And now that's costing the client money. So, but making that clear to the client, here's why we're making those decisions, because it reduces costs for you. It, and we, we don't waste the court's resources in certain, some of these things. So increasing stress for attorneys, we talked about that before, when you have an obstreperous counsel on the other side, for no reason, it creates stress for attorneys. The attorney can also suffer professional harm. A lot of times, as we know in the news, if it bleeds, it leads. So on, in the ABA journal, the weekly news, typically it's about some lawyer or judge acting un, in an uncivil manner, and then they get branded that way. I'll give you an example of that here in a second, but certainly perpetuating negative perceptions and stereotypes about lawyers and the legal system. We talked about that before. But what happened because of all the incivility in the legal profession a over 140 state bars and local bars have created civility codes. Okay, that's how bad it got. That you have all these codes out there. Most of these are aspirational. So most of them are just, here's what we hope lawyers will do. And here's a couple of rules found down in, in there. A lawyer owes the duty of courtesy. A lawyer should treat others with uh, courtesy and civility. A client has no right to demand that counsel abuse the opposite party or indulge in offensive conduct. So most of those, again, are aspirational. Also, 24 out of 50 states have added some type of civility language to the attorney oath, including, and if, this, and if you look at ABOTA's website, ABOTA is the American Board of Trial Advocates. I'm telling that to the students who are in here. Uh, and ABOTA is made up of plaintiffs, attorneys, and defense counsel. And they said Minnesota is one of those states. And here's the language underlined that relates to civility. So 24 states have added this in there. Now, Texas recently added, not recently, probably a few years ago by now, but they added it under one condition. You cannot use this oath as a basis for sanctions, as a basis for punishment. So you might argue, well, what is the point of putting it in the oath if it's not going to have any force? Other people say, taking an oath means something to them. If I'm, if I'm actually saying I'm going to do this as a lawyer, then I'm going to do this. Now, four states and only four states have made civility mandatory. 
And again, by some Christmas miracle, one of them is Florida. One of them is Arizona, uh, Michigan, and South Carolina. So those are the four states. There have been some federal district courts that have done that as well. Now, South Carolina, they have added civility to their oath, and they had every single lawyer who wanted to practice, continue practicing law in South Carolina or, be, or continue their license in South Carolina, retake the oath, retake the oath. So no matter if they were in New York practicing, but they still want to hold on to their South Carolina license, they had to retake the oath so they would be put on notice and then they can be sanctioned for uncivil behavior. And a lot of what we do here at St. Thomas Law School includes professional identity formation. You probably heard this before, but the incredible work that's been done by the co-directors, not me, I'm actually an associate director. Um, where is, where's Andrew, did he already leave? Uh, he's sick of this. Oh, you're still here, okay, great. Uh, so, but I'm actually an associate director. One of the things that brought me to St. Thomas Law, besides the, the students who are tremendous, besides the elite faculty is the Holleran Center. So the co-directors, Neil Hamilton and Jerry Oregon, have been on the road and preaching about professional identity formation and professional identity. That's a big part of the curriculum here, especially that first, first year and also coaching and roadmaps and, and the mentorship that goes on here to the point where the ABA changed their standards on, for curriculum so that every law school now has to provide substantial opportunities for the development of law students' professional identity. The, the two folks there, Jerry, Jerry Oregon, Neil Hamilton, they have literally, with the support and the help of St. Thomas Law through the Holleran Center and the faculty and the administration here have changed legal education forever, okay? So professional identity, helping law students figure out what are the characteristics, traits, competencies, what do I need to do to be a good lawyer St. Thomas Law, the Harlan Center at the forefront of that work. And here, there was a, this was a study that was done in 2000. These results came out in 2016. And this was, they surveyed over 24,000 lawyers. And civility is what nine, nearly 92% of lawyers said, this is what all lawyers need when they start off to be successful at the beginning of their legal practice. So it's not just the, the academics. Actually, I'm the only law professor I know that writes about mandatory civility. I'm the only one that I'm aware of that is advocating for mandatory civility. And I think everybody should advocate for it. But uh, a lot of you know, our, our, our scholars here, the, the, the professors here write in a ton of different areas and they are top notch. Uh, I am one who writes sometimes in this area uh, but no other no other professor out there is doing this. But here we are recognizing how important it is at St. Thomas Law to treat others with civility. But it's not just me. It's just not some academics who say, yeah, civility is good. It's lawyers who are practicing, you out there, who know how important this is. So what about civility in the, in the rules of professional conduct? Well, in the comment to Rule Point 1 on diligence, the lawyer's duty to act with reasonable diligence does not require the use of offensive tactics or preclude the treating of all persons involved in legal process with courtesy and respect. So these things are embedded in the rules. And again, in preamble paragraph nine, these principles include the lawyer's obligation to zealously protect and pursue a client's legitimate interest within the bounds of the law while maintaining a professional, courteous and civil attitude toward all persons involved in the legal system. I think this is a, Important to note that clients want people who will fight for them. And when I talk about civility, I tell law students and lawyers that you should, and this is my motto whenever I practiced, uh, whether I was defending Chevron or IBM or working on behalf of a pro, uh, pro bono client, my philosophy is let's attack and then we attack and then we attack some more. So I was not... I, I, civility is not, I have to be passive. I have to do what the other side says. That's not civility. But when we attack, we attack their arguments. We attack the merits of their case. We don't attack the opposing party or the opposing counsel personally. That is the way the Catholics say, yes, we, we want to attack. We want to fight. We want to be, we want to fight for our clients. 
but we want to do it in a certain way so that it is, re it is reflective of who we are as Catholics. And really, as, as any human, even if you're not Catholic, we want, to have, we want to try to treat others, regardless of their faith or back, whatever it is, with dignity and respect. So uh, here's an example. This, and you may have seen this. This was from a while ago. This was 2008. So this was in Texas after Hurricane Ike, which was a terrible hurricane. I was actually living in Texas with my wife at the time. Uh, she's still my wife. That didn't come out right. Uh, uh, we actually just had our 19th wedding anniversary yesterday. So uh, you don't have to applaud. No, that's fine. That's okay. Now it's fake applause. It's forced. I'll take it. So this was happening after Hurricane Ike. And it was, this is, the other side had called for, had noticed up a deposition and this particular lawyer could not make it to the deposition. Okay, this lawyer couldn't make it to the deposition. And these lawyers are from Houston. The person writing this is from Houston and the person on the other side is from Dallas. So I guess you could think of this maybe as someone from Minneapolis writing to someone in Green Bay uh, around this time of the year. But this is from the lawyer in Houston to Dallas saying, here's why I didn't get to that deposition. And this is literally from, you can find this on the internet, and I'm literally taking these words as copy and paste. I am sorry that a hurricane hit Houston. I'm sorry that I had no power or water at my house as a result of the hurricane. I am sorry that I had to extend my state of state because of the hurricane. I am sorry that Centerpoint Energy did not bend more quickly to your desires and restore power to my home so that I could return to it sooner. I am sorry that upon returning to my home on Monday, I discovered a roughly 50 by 60 foot swath of human excrement, used condoms, and all the other niceties that come with a raw sewage leak in one's backyard, which drains into one of the main bayous in Houston. I'm sorry that I had to threaten city of Houston officials with lawsuits and local news exposure in order to get them to even agree to meet with me about cleaning up the problem. I am sorry that these officials chose a date and interfered with our deposition and gave me no other option. I am sorry that the Houston Public Works Department had to use a fire hose to blow human excrement out of my yard on the day our deposition was scheduled. So hopefully you're realizing this really is not an I'm sorry letter, more I'm sorry, not sorry. I'm sorry that the city required my presence at the debacle noted immediately above. I'm sorry that you are the only lawyer in this case that consistently goes out of his way to be unaccommodating and unprofessional with the other lawyers and the end of the letter simply read, I am sorry you are from Dallas. <laughs> so sometimes in the practice of law, if you've done it long enough, there are going to be times where it's very tense. And the passion of law, the, 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 the passion that's involved in the practice of law, it comes out. So the states that typically have these rules about mandatory civility, it's usually substantial or repeated. So it's not one outburst where you're like, you know, say an expletive or whatever the case may be. We've all done that. If you practice law, it's, it's had to have happened once. If we have time, I'll tell you about uh, when it happened to me. Uh, but this is not what the civility rules are about. It's about making conscious choices after time to reflect to then be uncivil yourself. And you could see that you could hear the frustration with this lawyer and it was going, it was going okay here, here, then, but then towards the end, it was okay. Now we've, we've kind of lost it, but that's part of our job as lawyers to treat those with civility. And what, what could we have done there? Just let's, let's move the deposition. There's been a horrible hurricane. We'll move the deposition. We don't have to do it at this time, but part of it, and we have the formula, how do we deal with incivility? Turn the other cheek. As Catholics, we need to, and that's so much easier said than done. It's so much easier said than done, but that is the approach that we should be taking, that hopefully we take in a majority of the instances when we are faced with incivility ourselves, because that's really incredibly hard to do. The last thing that comes up, one of the, the last key that I think of is service. So obviously lawyers, we're in the service industry. That's what we do. We serve clients. We are fiduciaries of the clients. They rely on us. They trust us. That's what we do as lawyers. But it goes deeper. And we know that it starts in scripture. The greatest among you will be your servant. For even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. But part of being a lawyer is recognizing we can help others in ways that other people can't. 
we have knowledge, we have skills, we have abilities, we have access to the justice system that others simply don't. So it's about using our gifts that we've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. And it's not just we need to serve, it's who we need to serve. So open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Isaiah In Isaiah 117, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. So these ideas, these core values that we have as Catholics, they are embedded in what we do as lawyers. They're a part of the rules, literally, of how we should be conducting ourselves. So this is, again, this is rule 6.1, voluntary pro bono publico service. So pro bono for the good and then publico of the public. You're like, that's great. You, it sounds like you really took Latin in high school. I did. And really... <laughs> One of the things, one of the few things I remember is semper ubi sububi. Always wear underwear. All right. All right. My mom wants her money back from that high school. Every lawyer has a professional responsibility to provide legal services to those unable to pay. So this is the rule. Now, it goes on to say you should try to devote 50 hours every year. You should try to provide some type of financial assistance to organizations that, that if you can't provide this directly to folks that need it, then they can provide it. But it's not a must, it's not a must. And there have been arguments about making pro bono mandatory, whether it should be or not, but we still all have this responsibility. And I had cases where I was representing, again, major corporate clients, but the ones that stuck out to me were the pro bono cases. And those cases were the ones where if, if if I'd only done those pro bono cases, I would have been content in becoming a lawyer. I would have said it was worth it to become a lawyer. One of them was uh, for Gail Hansen. So Gail Hansen, she was a chaplain at a uh, at a at a jail. And again, I'm not going to try to. I'm not going to. You you know that joke already. Anyway, it was in Cameron County in Brownsville, Texas, and she came to us. Uh, through the Texas Civil Rights Project. And it's, it, it's, it was a case that I didn't know if we were going to take it. We met with her. She was telling us, and this all came, went into the complaint. So this is not privileged or confidential. Uh, she was telling us about the conditions at this jail. And she said that she talked to the inmates and some of the stories that she heard, one was of an inmate who was bleeding and was calling out, yelling out, screaming out for the guards, please help me, I'm pregnant, I'm bleeding. And eventually no one came and she had a miscarriage. There was another uh, inmate who was a teacher who had a DUI, made a horrible mistake one time, and then they, would, they wouldn't give her regular clothes, they put, gave her an adult diaper to wear. So took away her human dignity and treated her as less than. Then she was telling us about this inmate who said they got the wrong person. It's not me, right? And I'm thinking, okay, that's probably what all everybody's saying over there at this, uh, at this jail. And I said, from the perspective of a juror or opposing counsel, how are they going to, how are they going to hear this? What do we have? Do we have some type of evidence to support this claim? She said, yeah, here's the, here's the email from the judge to me. The judge had emailed her and said, we have this person. Thank you for letting us know that we had the wrong person. She's been in jail for six months and she's being released this afternoon. So, so at one point, our client, before, before we started representing her, she went to the sheriff and said, I'm so frustrated with the conditions here. I just feel like, you know, one day I'm going to get a bulldozer and break them all out. Okay. So. Then we have a, an election coming up, and the sheriff had, had opposition. So she went to, the, to a political meeting and talked about the poor conditions at the jail in regards, to this, uh, in, in regards to this election. After that, she goes back into the jail, and one of the first things that happens is she's taken to a separate room by three or four guards 
and searched very invasively. And she said she was just, she was intimidated. She was embarrassed. She was humiliated. And she gets out of there and set, talks to the sheriff and says, why did that happen? And they said, well, we think you're a security threat because you talked about breaking the inmates out of jail. So I don't know if you've seen any, any movies where there have been breakouts of prisons. First of all, usually it's not from a 61-year-old chaplain. But also, if you're planning to break someone out of, of the jail, you do not first tell the sheriff the means by which you'll be breaking folks out of jail. And unless you're in some type of Looney Tunes cartoon, you're probably not going to be using a bulldozer. So eventually, she was kicked out. She was banned from ministering to these women at the, at the jail. She was the source of inspiration, support, and help that those inmates needed. That's why she was doing it for all those years. She'd actually started a Christian school with her husband of 40 some years, but this was a big part of her life. So we were now we're tasked with taking this case on. And we said, yeah, well, let's take this case on. So talking to the junior associates who I let run the case, I, they were they were doing the, the legwork. I let them do the arguments, the, the depositions, everything. But I'm leading them. And a couple of times they were like, you know, I've got this other billable work. And I said, we have to we have to approach every case, whether it's billable or non-billable, with the high standards that we have at this firm. It doesn't matter what type of case we're working on. We go 100 percent. And the other thing is, well, you know, David, that's me. Well, David, uh, they only have one a counsel on the other side. And there's three of us here working on this case. I said, I don't care. Our client wants to get back in there. We're going to ask them for all the discovery that we need. We're not going to ask them for extra. We're not going to ask them for extraneous things, but we're going to ask them for everything we need. And we want it as soon as possible under the rules. Okay. So part of being Catholic, and if you go into any Catholic church, you'll see a crucifix and you will see the suffering, the suffering of Jesus. And that's part of what we have to internalize as Catholics. We will suffer, and we hopefully will suffer for, for God and for others, because that's what Jesus did for us. So part of it, hopefully, I'm going to challenge, challenge you now, the, the law students, certainly the lawyers in here, and anybody, when you have a chance, when you feel called, when you feel called to help someone in need, to provide that pro bono service or any other type of service, do it. Do it, even if it's going to increase your workload, even if it's going to push you. That suffering, it's, it's easy to do it when you have nothing else to do. Well, I'll do it. I'll do it on that Saturday. I have nothing else to do. It's harder to do when you have to push yourself, when there is that suffering, because that's what we are called to do as Catholics. And remember, Jesus said, we all have to carry, take up our cross. At some point, we have to all have to carry it and take up our cross. What he was saying there, as you'll hear from folks uh, who, who study who study this, that was radical, okay? So taking up your cross, remember the cross was a form of execution for criminals, all right? So that was something very, yeah, you're going to have to endure a lot of pain and misery, and I'm equating it to dying like a criminal in terms of this type of suffering that you're going to have to endure for Christ, okay? So it was radical, and we have to push ourselves in a way that only Jesus did in order to sacrifice for others, to sacrifice for others, okay? So hopefully we'll do that, and, and we'll take advantage of those opportunities because it's, it's ingrained in us to serve, and it's ingrained in us, and this is also, this is a Buddhist, this is also the, the Buddhists believe that suffering is a part of life. But Catholicism, I think, more than any other type of Christianity and religion, we focus on that suffering. And we, I hope, we embrace it. And when we go through those times, we understand that the suffering is eventually going to lead to something great. And that's how a lot of times from our losses, from our the toughest times in our lives, that's where we learn the most. That's where we absolutely learn the most. And I gave you the three keys. I gave you the three keys, human dignity and civility and service. But all of these things go to the secret to life. What's the secret to life? 
And I've given talks on this before. And I, I actually, in the, the first few times I did it, I think I got it wrong. I'm pretty sure I got it wrong. I said it was using your gifts to serve others. I was wrong. What are all these things talking about? Sacrificing for another, treating people with dignity and respect, serving others, putting somebody in front of you. All of these are different ways just to say love. That is, the, that is the basis of our religion as Catholics, to give love and to show love. It's to love God. It's to love others. That's what this is about. So we have the secrets. If you're ever wondering, well, how should I act? How should I approach this situation? You're always called to love. And sometimes it comes in different forms. Now I need to be patient understanding with opposing counsel. Now I have to speak up for someone. I have to be a voice for the voiceless and stand up for someone else because that's the way I will show love here. It's gonna come in different forms, but that hopefully will be our guide as Catholics and as all practicing lawyers on how we should approach every situation in the law and also in life. So usually at the end, I have questions and apologies. I've been married for 19 years now and, and there's only two phrases I need to know. I'm sorry and I love you. I just need to know when to say it, so. No. All right. Questions. We have time for questions. Yes, Professor. Talk about uh, civility and courtesy uh, and not getting personal about the approach. Mm -hmm. What about in cases that you described in the uh, one involving jail and making no idea of what the legal rights to it, which I am often saying. Uh, that the uh, uh, correctional officers on the other side have acted maliciously. They have deliberately and intentionally engaged in wrongdoing. Um, so I can't, I can't pull those punches. In fact, for some of the claims, it, the claim fails unless it was done intentionally as opposed to negligence. How do you reconcile? That? Right, that's a great question. So that I would say, go, I would argue, it goes to the merits of the case. That's part of the merits of the case where maybe you have to discredit a witness or you have to prove certain things in your cause of action we had to do the same thing we were painting a picture in that in that case the Cameron County case with Gail Hansen where we were getting discovery and some of the ads from the sheriff said we are saving money because we're not feeding the inmates so at some point if it's part of the case and you have to uh, you need to go after maybe someone's actions in order to prove the merits of your case, then you have to do that. We're talking about beyond the scope of, of what's happening in terms of the merits of the case. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, because sometimes that is uh, central to what you're trying to do, but that I think it's a little bit different. I mean, the, the other, the case I talked about, so that one of the cases where I was talking about with my client she was uh, from Mexico and she had a baby with a, with a man who was HIV positive who did not tell her he was HIV positive before they conceived. And my client said that the husband, or not the husband, the father of the child had raped her on seven occasions. So on cross-examination during the hearing, I made this guy look like the liar I believed he was. And after that hearing, after one of those hearings, I got a call from opposing counsel and the client and opposing client. And they called me and they said, this was when I was at uh, Jones Day in, in Los Angeles. They said, we're going to call the New York, the LA Times, and we're going to, and we're going to tell your firm that you don't like people with HIV, that you don't like people with AIDS, that your firm doesn't like people with AIDS, that, and we're going to sue your firm. So once they said that, so understand I'm a second or third year attorney on this case and they're calling me yelling at me telling me that they're going to tell these lies to the LA Times and my firm but once they said we're going to sue your firm I had then to go to I had to then go to my the lost liability partner and they had to evaluate the claim so this turned into a huge mess for the firm and at one point we had the chance to back out of the case and I didn't because it would have harmed the client, no matter how much personal and professional angst I had suffered over that case, it wasn't the right thing to do. But certainly when they're coming after you personally, and I didn't, I didn't fight back. 
I just said, you know, you can, those are lies. Those aren't true. And I'm going to basically, I'm going to have to report this to my firm. So it's a difficult, it's a lot easier to say, turn the other cheek. Okay. If you have, if you have kids, uh, it's a lot easier to tell them that rarely do they do that. Uh, but it's our job to try to model that in the opportunities that we can. Great question. Yes. So I guess on the turning the other cheek, yes, I was opposing counsel. Um, I'm a relatively new attorney dealing with opposing counsel who are often elderly, experienced male lawyers who like to move over me in uh, succession and refer to me as fear. Um, how would you advise a response in those situations? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And typically, honesty is always the best policy. I mean, sometimes giving people the benefit of the doubt, maybe they don't even know what they're doing. Maybe it's become such a habit to refer to women in those ways, which is obviously inappropriate, but just communicating with them and saying, look, it's, it's 2022, and I would really appreciate it if you would just refer to me by my first name. When you, when you call me dear, it kind of makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable. And I know you're not meaning it maliciously, uh, but I, if you just re refer to me as my, by my name, and then I'll refer to you by that. That helps me because I respect you. I respect what you do, but I want to continue to work on this case as opposing counsel in a way where we are uh, respecting each other. I mean, it's it's difficult. I mean, and, and I one time I flew off the handle, one time. So I my my youngest son had just been born, and I have two sons, and Solomon and Moses. If we have another one, we'll just name them Lord or God. I'll cut right to the chase. You've heard these jokes before. Just pretend to laugh as well. But uh, there is somebody. So, um, and my youngest son had just been born and I was flying from Houston to California for these Chevron cases every other week for three or four months for a week at a time. And we were trying to get a deposition and I had to go to the court because they wouldn't even give us a date. We're trying, just trying to figure out a date. I had to do a motion to compel just to get a court date just to get a date for the deposition, fly out there to beautiful Fresno. I'm at one of their finest restaurants, a Denny's, and I get a, a text, or I was actually on my BlackBerry, and it said the deposition for tomorrow is canceled. So, and this was again, court ordered because they wouldn't even give us a date for the deposition. And now I'm out there at the Denny's and I called up who, uh, uh, opposing counsel who well, I considered a friend and I just started yelling and screaming. I don't curse. So it was a lot of uh, gosh darn it and dad gums. But uh, it, it, I was like, why are you doing this? Like you have other people at the firm. Anybody can defend this deposition. We had to go through. We had to spend money just to get out here, blah, blah, blah. And I had to stay and file a motion to compel uh, that next, that, that day or that morning uh, so that we could try to get the deposition done earlier. So, and I actually then, call the next day to apologize. I said, that was unprofessional. I shouldn't have done that because he had kids and I was bringing that in. You have kids, Evan, you know, why were you doing this to me? But I still shouldn't have acted like that. So it's one of those things where, you know, I, I always try to create a relationship with opposing counsel to where we were friends and we would then try to destroy each other's cases in court. And we would still walk out as friends to the point where what did my opposing counsel, when she left her plaintiff's firm, called me to be a reference for her, for her new job where she was looking to work. So that's where, but the honesty, the honesty, I think that's the, but it, those times I hope are changing, but it's going to take folks. I know you don't want to, if you stand up and, and say something, now you're going to be labeled. And then we go, we get into the different things where women, and I'm mansplaining to you now, but where women do some type of behavior and then are labeled something where men could do the exact same thing and be labeled something else. Well, you, you get all riled up. Oh, wow, that, that lawyer, he's passionate. He's wonderful. A woman does it, but oh, she's emotion. I mean, it's a bunch of BS. They're recording this. I don't swear anyway. I don't know why I looked at this, but 
Uh, it's just a bunch of BS and it's added layers that women have to deal with that guys don't. And it drives me absolutely insane. So, uh, and I've, I've suggested in the past, you know, my wife was a principal. She has her doctorate in education. Uh, and anytime I say, well, you know, have someone at the firm help talk to somebody. Well, now it sounds like you're having some guy fight the battle for you. That looks even worse. So I would just try honesty. I don't know if I answered your question, but. I don't get to talk this much at home, so <laughs> I'm on a roll. All right, any other questions? Any other, yes? Well, this is just an example, but there was one time I was supposed to be initiated a telephone call with the judge and told him to ask him. I did absolutely didn't have to understand what they were writing, what was that ball. And opposing counsel called me and said, hey, someone had a call and you know, just initiated this on his cell phone. That was so nice to pull me down so he could have just let me fall on my face. Now it looked good to the judge. Very angry to do that. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. I mean, and hopefully we would extend that same courtesy, even when not asked, so that we can again try to try to conduct ourselves in a way where I don't want to say we're putting others first, but we're we're being considerate. We're being considerate of others because that's how we would want to be treated. And I, yeah, that's when we're opposing counsel could have just called the judge and said, so and so is a flake. Opposing counsel is a flake. He doesn't care. This case might not be important to him, but it is to me. And they didn't do that. And I'm sure that maybe, I don't know, did, did that influence you? Did that influence you in the future to think about how? you were treating opposing counsel in certain instances or no? Oh, yes. That's great. That's awesome. That's great. Any, yes? Pretty the client versus courtesy. After about 48 years of practicing law, I've been full of appeals on the matter. And I basically it was a some of the statute of limitations of the person that fled something good. And I knew the case was ongoing, and I knew of the statute. And I waited till the statute had run, and I put on a motion to dismiss. And at the Court of Appeals, and there were other issues in the case, and the Court of Appeals, one of the Court of Appeals judges was on me, unbelievable. Did you have a professional ruling to respond to? Did you have a duty of courtesy to call that attorney and tell them that the statute of limitations is going to run? And I said, I'd be there as a defendant in a malpractice case if I did that. And he went on and on and on and on. One judge, and the other two judges sat there and said nothing. And I waited until we got a final decision, which was pretty to the time. And I was going up to the Court of Appeals and I called the judges. The other two judges, I said, I'd like to come up and read this. And they said, you don't have to. They said, don't call me to pay your soul. That we didn't chime in and shut that guy up. And uh, he said, well, we face that uh, on occasions where people try to use the rules for the professional responsibility of courtesy and civility to the detriment of a company representing them. I, I took an example of using a battle between the lynching duty of if I was a, you know, a nice guy, I would call it right away, you know, get my client my value on the way. Right. I mean, I, that's a great example. I think it goes back to the point of provided it doesn't harm your client, provided it doesn't prejudice your client. And the way we frame it, as we know, as lawyers, that's one of the most important things we do. If we frame it as are you being courteous or are you framing it? Are we framing it as you're doing his or her job? Because if you're framing it as, do you want me to do the opposing counsel's job? Then why should we? So I think that I, that's how I would view it. I mean, why is it your job to, uh, to alert them when that they should be on top of it? So it, it's one of those things that it's a great example. It's a great example. I mean, what would others do? Would you tell opposing counsel the statute of limitations is about to run out here. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure who would. Would you? Well, dealing with my clients, if you just ask the question, if I have ongoing litigation, since I have to go to the judge, and they can combine goodwill, 
and my current Brisbane, because usually I'd let them fall. I mean, that's not self advocacy. You know what it is. But our clients pay our bills. Mm -hmm. and show them we have a debt and disability and they say, yes, right to the unique situation for one of the Right. And there may be other considerations, like you mentioned. Is the opposing party some party that you want to have continued types of potentially uh, engaging with them? Maybe the client wants to engage with them as well, but knowing you're going to meet that opposing counsel potentially again. But yeah, you go to the client and you say, here's the situation. Here's what I recommend. That's a, that's a difficult situation. Yeah. The attorney in this case didn't even raise the question with me. He was not upset with me. Sure. The judge himself brought it up. And then the attorney just sat there and said, this could be right. Yeah, I, I haven't. That's interesting. Yeah, I haven't been in that situation myself. I don't I don't know if I would have. I don't think I would have told opposing counsel. Right. Oh, yeah. Well, did you did you guys win? All right. Well, that's all it that matters. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's an that's a tough one. That's interesting. Any other thoughts or scenarios or hypotheticals or situations that you've encountered? Or this is sounding like at the end of my classes where everybody starts shuffling their papers and they're ready to go. And if anybody asks a question, it'll be trouble for them outside of the classroom. Well, thank you all so much for coming. Really appreciate it.